So, uh, we have two things again to talk about this week, though both of these are Yu-Gi-Oh! based, so that's probably a bit better. Um, the first thing is actually very bad news, and that is yesterday, Yu-Gi-Oh! singles officially shut down, they closed shop, and they're having these huge blowout sales, so get there while you can. Um, and this is very sad, because Yu-Gi-Oh! singles was very popular for having most of the lowest prices on the net, because what they would do is instead of pricing things based on where they were at the moment, they'd base them on where they would settle. So you could get a lot of amazing cards for very great value, because they valued community and be having a good reputation over just making a quick buck. They also did a lot for the community in general. They were big sponsors of the Zodiac tournaments. They uh, were big donors to John Moore's charity stream a few weeks back, or maybe that was more recent, I don't remember. Um, but they did a lot to really give back to the community, and that's great to see a company value integrity like that. Um, but now they're gone, and this is bad for many reasons. First up, basic economic principles. One less company competing for your dollar means one less company that other companies need to worry about. So that essentially lowers competition. And well, you kind of want competition because the more sites competing for your attention means the more we win. Uh, capitalism, baby. Um, so that's bad on that front. It's also bad because you've got to wonder why they're leaving if they were so popular for buying singles. Well, though nothing has been 100% confirmed, Jonathan Moore brought this up on, his, on the House of Champs Market Watch yesterday, and I believe him on this. John Moore is another guy who seems to value reputation and integrity a lot, so this seems very legitimate, and also he's dealt with them a lot over the years, so he knows a lot of them personally, most likely. And according to him, they don't want to deal with Konami anymore. They don't like the direction the company's going, they don't like the way Yu-Gi-Oh! handles dealing with the community, they don't like a lot of the decisions being made, and I completely 100% can see that. Konami is a hated company, one of the most disliked in the world, and their decisions the past several years have been atrocious. And well, look at what's been happening with product. Sealed product has really lost a lot of value over the past few years, in part due to bad core sets that really screw up rarities, like making all this shit that shouldn't matter high rarities. Like the one I always think of is Circuit Break. Those two rocket cards were secret rares for no reason, while something that could have been a chase card like Babusco was only a super. Uh, then you look at, like, Extreme Force, Cybernetic Horizon. Like, these sets are just full of garbage that have just been rarity bumped just to make it harder. Because it looks like all sets nowadays short print stuff people really want. I think short prints are a big part of the problem. Ever since that Maximum Crisis debacle, where they, like, short printed every secret rare besides Ash and like Zark, not Ash, uh, they short printed Ash, they didn't short print like Zark and Ultra Polymerization. The, I don't think Konami has really um, moved past that, I don't think we of the community have really fully trust them, and if you're Yu-Gi-Oh! singles, you don't want to be associated with that. And then look at reprint sets, the Megatons this year were kind of a bust, because, at and again, they didn't ban everything like they did with the Zoo cards last year. But they put in like double the secret rares and once again reprinted all the shitty ones and made those ones the better chances to pull. If you're Yu-Gi-Oh! singles, it can be dangerous investing in sealed product if it almost feels like the product is designed to make it that you can't really recoup your loss. Same with Battles of Legend. Last year, Battles of Legend was set of the year because it allowed for you to get everything fairly easily. This year, they double the secret rare count and don't even put a lot of juicy stuff in there. What was the biggest card from that set? Like, Stromberg? Who cares? And then if that's not enough, you have, like, other reprint sets, like Shadows of Valhalla, that very clearly just put things like Ash Blossom in there just to get your attention, and then that gets short printed, and that was even a super rare. So ultimately, that's not as bad, but again, for singles, it can be dangerous. And don't get me wrong, I like that they reprinted the Invoke stuff, the uh, Valkyries and Ninjas are very fun decks, but... The bread and butter of that set was Ash, which was taken away from value from the Megatons, and was put into this, and then is still risky because you still can't guarantee you'll pull enough to make your overhead. 
So that's very much troublesome. But it's also troublesome because a lot of other companies have pulled out of Konami lately. And that's not really a good sign. And I can't help but wonder if maybe they're catching wind of something even worse to come. This is purely speculative. But if they've maybe been catching on to trends and see that those trends are either continuing or that under dangerous things are coming, like maybe a big regime change going on in the company or other problems that they don't want to get involved with to any degree, yeah, that is a very good reason to pull out now. Basically what I'm saying is that this felt very urgent and felt like it kind of came out of nowhere, which kind of makes me sort of start wondering if there's bigger problems to come. And I don't want there to be bigger problems to come, because I would much rather happily talk about this week's Yu-Gi-Oh! Brains. Yeah, this week was actually really good. I quite enjoyed this episode. It had a lot of fascinating aspects to it. Uh, but the one thing I do want to address very quickly, I don't really like Revolver's new outfit. I said so last week, and I was sort of hoping it would grow on me over the course of this episode. It didn't. <laughs> It just, it, there's too much going on, and I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to sort of copy what they did with Aoi. Sort of the design reflects the merging of the two halves of the character's personality. Where Blue Angel, st or Blue Girl, still combines the colors and the basic premise of Blue Angel, it has more of Aoi's build and characteristics in there, representing how she's grown into herself. They're trying to do that with Revolver, but I don't think it really works. I think there's too many distracting design choices. I don't think the hair really goes with the mask, and the face doesn't really seem to work with anything. The costume itself looks too similar, just with some weird color accent changes, and I just think they aren't very appealing looking. But... My only problem is the look. The rest of this was fucking fantastic. I love the aspect of this that essentially, no matter what Yusaku does, he's helpless. And this is a character who, much to his own detriment, has been made out to be this unstoppable badass, but here he is, basically at the mercy of two warring factions of lunatics. On the one hand are these AIs who basically feel that humanity must go for them to succeed and be safe. And on the other hand, you have these other crazy people who already almost brought Western society to a fall and basically feel that all the computers must go if things are to be okay. And I like that neither side is made out to be heroic. It's just this is the messed up things these people are involved with. You do buy the AI's drama, but I mean, we're people, so we don't really want to die. But then on the other hand, you do get where Revolver is coming from. But I like that... Revolver isn't made out to be the good guy here. Look at Hanoi, look at Revolver, how he's acting, how he's talking. Everything is based around reminding you this guy is still insane and he's still not the good guy. You look at Spectre and how much he enjoys destroying the home that Windy and Light are trying to rebuild. You see the other three and how they're just so blindly dedicated to all this destruction and imposing of their will. The show isn't trying to say anyone is right or wrong here. It is simply saying that this is the things these people are doing and someone's got to figure out a way to deal with it and nobody knows. I like how they keep sort of twisting each other's logic, like how they sort of reinterpret Dr. Kagami and their purposes and what they should be doing. It really is a fascinating concept of just that idea of nothing absolute. Everything can be tainted. Everything can be made out to be dangerous or harmful. It really sets in the helplessness. And then you just have the power Revolver is emanating during this whole thing. Nothing phases him. Lightning attacks. Tornado attacks. You really get the sense that this guy has gotten stronger and more dangerous. And it only makes leaves you scratching your head more about who you kind of want to win this duel. The duel itself is also a real interesting concept and a nice change of pace. They're competing over who gets to use Magic Cylinder. This is kind of a neat idea because in a format with only 4,000 life points, Magic Cylinder is actually really deadly. Like, think about it, you see it in this episode. One bore load attack on the card almost takes out all of Revolver's life points. It's also neat because in this series, so many cards feel disposable and unimportant. The idea that one card can really change the way of a game in an actual way that feels legitimate and logical is a really good change of pace, and I really quite enjoyed it. Also, I think it's funny that essentially Windy is playing a Link version of Grisaria, which as, a, which as a competitive player very much makes me happy. 
Um, so yeah, that was the episode. Really enjoyed just the concepts on all being executed on screen. And finally, we move on to the TCG question of the week. And that is, so with the implementation of our new ban list and Stratos being at one, do you think that heroes actually stand a chance as a viable, good rogue deck? And what I mean by that, I don't mean that thing you use to annoy at locals. Do you think we will see pure heroes steal some regionals and maybe even a YCS top or two? I think it's plausible, but the problem is, is that the deck is still too tied to Dark Law and is so geared on getting him out as fast as possible, it's hard for them to bounce back once he's been killed or if they can't open him. I'm experimenting with pure heroes myself, we'll probably go back to Goki Hero once I know when the next event I'm going to is, uh, but I am curious to see what people think, cause um, again, I did a big video about it. a lot of people have talked about the implications of this ban list, but ultimately the thing we're all just happy is Stratos is free. Uh, tell me if you're happy about that below and what you think about the hero's uh, viability of this format. Uh, tell me about this episode. Tell me what you think about Yu-Gi-Oh! singles going, if you've ordered from them for the past and if this kind of makes you feel heartbroken. And as always, click to like, click to subscribe, and keep tuning in for further details on Konami potentially just falling like the Hindenburg.